Welcome to another program in our series, Free Thinking Forum. My name is Bill Weir, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome Mel Duncan. Thank you, Bill. It's good to be here. Mel, you, you founded an organization many years ago that now has spread out in the, through the world. And it, it's just amazing. Uh, founding director, you're now uh, director of advocacy and outreach. And I can see that from uh, some of the facts that I've learned about NP, nonviolent peacemakers, that we're uh, you, just, you're on, you're on the brink of doing even more. The That's UN, right. uh, the, the papal uh, uh, conference and so on we'll talk about. But uh, what, how did the idea for nonviolent peace force come to you? First, let me say that I was one of the founders. There were many of us who were working on this idea of how could well-trained, unarmed civilians protect other civilians who were under threat. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it had happened in a variety of places around the world. I first went to Nicaragua in the early 1980s when uh, there was a war that was being waged against the government of Nicaragua uh, that, uh, the, uh, that was supported by our government. And what we found was that if there were people from the United States or people from Western Europe or Canada who stayed in the villages that were being attacked by the Contra, who were uh, trained and supported by the U.S. government, that the Contra would stay away. And that was my first inkling that something like this could work and could be effective. For seven years, there were delegations, primarily of people from the U.S., who went and stayed in those cotton and coffee harvesting villages on the northern border. And during that seven-year period, Bill, not one of those villages was ever attacked. So that was the planting of the seed. So you really began nonviolent peace force in that Nicaraguan uh, war. Well, that was where one of the, the streams conceptual streams came from. But it took another 15 years Ooh. where I, I, I was off doing other things. And then I was fortunate to get a Bush Fellowship that allowed oh. me to spend a year and a half studying the connections between grassroots organizing around peace, justice, and the environment, and spirituality. Well, and Thank that, goodness for the Bush Fellowship. Yes, that led me to places I never imagined. Early in that fellowship, I was confronted by a teacher of mine who was a Sufi. A Sufi? Yes, and what? we were in a class on Rumi, the Persian poet. From oh, yeah. And he, I didn't know who Rumi was. I didn't know what a Sufi was. And that first day of class, she stared at me and she said, and your job is to enter the heart of your enemy. Ooh. And I looked at her, and I quickly looked to make sure all my other classmates were there. They were all there. And from that moment on, she and others challenged the dualistic way that I saw the world, the dualistic way that I worked, us versus them, right versus wrong, good versus evil. and. I was being challenged right to my core to start working from an understanding of our unity. That led me to start studying this Vietnamese monk by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh. A little over a year later, I was sitting in a Buddhist monastery with Thich Nhat Hanh. And he, this was 1998, he was saying, we are no longer in a place in history where we can afford to take sides. The stakes are much too high. This was 1998. He already saw what so many of us now understand and, and uh, are acting upon. And so I left Plum Village, this Buddhist monastery, writing in a notebook 
a reflection on a nonviolent peace force. So from there, I wound up going to a conference in The Hague in 1999 where people were coming together to create an agenda to do away with war during the 21st century. And they gathered in the Netherlands. In The Hague. In the capital, yeah? Yes. And so who were these people that you gathered with? Uh, they were people from throughout the world who were working on peace and justice. Uh, many Nobel Peace Prize winners were there. Uh, Kofi Annan, the then Secretary General of the UN, people working on the front lines of struggles in uh, uh, Central America, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in Indonesia. Uh, and I showed up with a, a one-page sheet of paper single-spaced with this idea. No money. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I had to find a free place to stay in The Hague. And there, instead of 5,000 people, 9,000 people showed up. So I couldn't organize. Every venue was jammed. So I called Georgia, my wife, back in St. Paul, and I said, I can't organize here. I could stand up on a chair and start yelling, and I'd just fit into the background noise. She said, well, then be quiet and listen. <laughs> so the next day, I'm in the back of a room. I'm listening, and in the form of a question, another guy lays out the same vision of a well-trained, unarmed civilian peace force. I went through the crowd. I grabbed him by the arm, and I said, if you're serious about what you just said, we have to go out in the hall and start organizing. By that night, we were pulling together people from throughout the world who shared this vision. In fact, what we learned was that it was a recurrent vision, that Gandhi was working on the Shanti Sena, Sanskrit for Peace Army, that uh, Bacha Khan, the nonviolent soldier of Islam, had been organizing this among uh, the Pushtuns, the same ethnic group that make up the Taliban. Uh, that this was happening in the Philippines. This was happening in El Salvador. This was happening in South Africa. And so more than being the founder, I was one of the people who held the focus so that people who had had this recurrent vision that we can't deal with violence by bringing in more violence, that we deal with violence by bringing in nonviolence, by bringing in peace and understanding and dialogue and listening. And from there, the concept of nonviolent peace force grew. Good. Well, how does this nonviolent peace force respond to the need for civilian protection? We are invited by local groups hmm. that live and work in the war zones because our allegiance is to the grassroots groups mm -hmm. that are under threat. And then I, once we receive an invitation, we will send an assessment team that looks at the conflict, uh, tries to understand all the different combatants and understand the underpinnings of politics and economics and other dynamics that are there. And then look at, are the methods that we can provide, is there a chance for us to be effective? Mm -hmm. So we do this assessment in concert with the groups that have, been invi have invited us. And then we bring that back to our board and they assess and then make a decision as to whether we can start a project. So at this very moment, we are preparing to send an assessment team to Burundi mm, uh, yeah. to uh, assess the situation that really is on the brink of perhaps tremendous violence uh, and see if there's something that we can do working always with the local people uh, to turn away from that violence, to protect civilians, and to deter further violence. That, that, that is a great gift to the world, to have that kind of, w w that group uh, that you have created uh, uh, able to respond to Burundi and the yes. many other places. Yes. Uh, do you think people's perceptions about 
responding to conflict or shifting based on the work you're doing? Slowly. When they see the proof, they can't turn away from it. Uh, yeah. And what we have shown is that in a variety of areas of violent conflict, whether that be Sri Lanka or the Mindanao region in the Philippines, South Sudan, we now have a project that started in Syria. When they see that indeed well-trained, unarmed civilians can effect, effectuate methods that will protect civilians and deter violence, then of course they become, their perceptions change. Great. And so we are uh, doing this slowly because the myth of redemptive violence dies very hard for good reason. There's billions of dollars behind that myth. Oh yes. And uh, yet right now, today, there are more people under greater threat and losing their homes because of violent conflict really? for longer periods of time than any time since World War II. Wow, that's, and that that's number, dangerous. That number is growing by 40,000 people a day. Ooh. And so we need really to thoroughly look at what works and what doesn't work and then scale up those approaches that are effective and cost effective so that less innocent civilians are getting killed. Well, it's, it's, it's heartening to realize that your reputation has led to your being called to Rome, to uh, <laughs> uh, where the Pontifical Council on Peace and Justice uh, brought you and, uh, and uh, 80 other delegates, uh, uh, experts on nonviolence from around the world to, because they really recognize, the Pope recognized a need to re-examine the just war doctrine. Uh, so tell us what happened. Uh, I, I see the article, uh, did the Vatican just throw out its just war doctrine? What do you say to that? I think it did. Wow. Uh, in mid-April, the Pontifical Council on Peace and Justice and the international group Pax Christi invited 85 of us to Rome to spend uh, a few days re-examining the just war doctrine. The just war doctrine that really had its beginnings, as, as you know better than I. 1,500 years ago. Yes, and uh, has influenced uh, war making in the West since then, and also I think influenced the way that we approach violence. Yes. The Pope invited us and said that he wanted our suggestions on alternatives to this. And so uh, uh, the meeting was called to order by the uh, Cardinal Tur Turkson from Ghana, mm -hmm. who uh, read the invitation letter from the Pope. And then uh, we worked, many of us had never met before. There were bishops and priests and nuns, but also people at the front lines dealing with struggles and violence in places like Colombia and Uganda and Palestine. And in a little over two days, we had consensed on a statement saying, we, know, we do not believe there is such a thing as a just war and the Catholic Church needs to turn to just peace and to focus its energy and its power on creating a just peace doctrine in this world. And did you have any recommendations for the doctrine? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you uh, did, out of your experience. There were very specific uh, examples of how to do this. Because as they say in Washington, the least asked question uh, is then what? And so if we say just peace, we have to be able to illustrate that yes. with what does that mean? And of course, a part of that is the work that we do as nonviolent peace force of unarmed civilian protection, of providing protection to civilians who are caught up amid war without bringing in more guns. There's also many different approaches to peace building that deals with the more structural issues that create violence and where local people 
build peace one village, one locale by a time. There are uh, the uh, restorative justice approaches uh, where we do away with, with puni the punitive, violent nature and uh, deal with restoring justice and people taking uh, responsibility and being accountable for uh, the violence that they have brought on. So there's a host of and activities. Using that to resolve the, the ill feelings. That yes. Really great, important work. That yes. So and, and it's a matter, the, the just war doctrine has really helped the church to focus on instruments of war. Yes. And so now what we're saying is we have to reverse that trend and to focus on instruments of peace. Do we have all of them? No. But if we continue to focus and say, this is the kind of people that we want to become, the moral imaginations will be further sparked and we will create more and more ways to bring about a just peace. Now, let's get into a bit of detail here. Where do you have your programs? You've mentioned several places in the world. What? Yes. Our biggest project right now is in South Sudan, where there has been the reignition of a civil war for a, a little, almost two and a half years, uh, and where we are doing a tremendous amount of work, for example, in uh, preventing gender-based oh. violence. Uh, that is a, a photo from one of our teams in Mindanao in the southern Philippines. Uh, this was a situation where during a ceasefire yeah. that was called, we were invited to be a part of that uh, ceasefire and to uh, monitor and intervene on threats to civilians. Mm -hmm. So in this case, there was uh, a patrol of the armed forces of the Philippines and a patrol of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front that were approaching a village, this was in 2010, and they'd gotten within a half kilometer. And the people started to pack up, to flee. They were panicking. And remember what I told you, there's more people displaced now than any time since World War II. The elders of that village called one of our teams that lived nearby and told them what was happening. So our team, which was made up of people from a dozen or so different countries, said, well, we're on the way. And in route, in this day and age, in modern warfare, you have the local commanders on speed dial. So they called up the local commander of the armed forces of the Philippines. They called up the local commander of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and said, there must be a mistake. Your guys are conver converging on this village. They're about to flee. We know you don't want that to happen. And further, we know that you know that would be a violation of the ceasefire. So to make sure that it doesn't happen, we're sending a team that will stay in the village until your guys back off. Both armed groups back, backed off and a thousand people stayed home. Wow, that's, that's a great gift to those people. Yeah. To be able to stay in their homes instead of fleeing from conflicting uh, armies that uh, would probably ruin their community. Burn it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, now uh, that's what it looks like in. That's in Mindanao. Mindanao. And what, what does your work look like in other countries? Well, in South Sudan, there it, are areas where people have congregated because they have fled that are called protection of civilian areas. Hmm. And I, there, oh, there we have a, a photo. Some of these areas have as many as 100,000 people right now wow. who are crammed in there. Every day, women have to leave to collect firewood, to collect water, to provide for their families. And there are soldiers, both of the government's soldiers and militias who will lurk on the outside of those camps 
and will gang rape the women. Ooh. Women's bodies have become war, fields of war. And I, this is done intentionally and is done strategically. What we find is if two to four of our unarmed civilian protectors accompany 20 to 30 women, the soldiers look the other way and leave them alone. Oh. Last year we did this with over 6,000 women. Not one of them was harassed in any way. So right now, Bill, we have 200 people on the ground in South Sudan. Think if we had 2,000. Oh, what a gift that would be to resolving, the, preventing the conflict from yes. doing even more damage, Yes. especially to those women. And we can do it. Yeah. Is, is there something unique about the nonviolent Peace Force work compared to other groups? Well, we are one of, right now, there's a, a dozen international non-governmental organizations that are doing some type of unarmed civilian protection in the world in mm -hmm. 17 areas of violent conflict around the world. And what makes Nonviolent Peace Force unique are a number of things. First of all, we em employ a variety of methods, 10 different methods that have been proven to work. We don't just parachute in with rucksacks full of good intentions. <laughs> Our people are well trained, they're strategic, we're matching the methods to the conflict and seeing what will work our teams come from 25 different countries, and they're paid. This is not volunteer, this is mm -hmm. professional work. They do this work 24 seven. And so uh, it looks different every place you go because those methods are employed depending on the local nature of the conflict. We always work from the bottom up. Our connection is to the, gra the grassroots on the ground where the foundation of peace is laid. Oh. So uh, that's, that's marvelous what you explained uh, to help these folks. And uh, uh, this is an ever increasing worldwide violent crisis. Is there something more you can do in response to that? Yes, there's much more that we can do. I, when you look at the fact that uh, all told, I think the 12 organizations that are doing this have less than a thousand people deployed throughout the world. Wow. And you compare that to how quickly President Obama can announce again today that he's sending several hundred more uh, advisors to Syria or that uh, this country is sending thousands of troops here, thousands of troops there. When indeed, we can s train, equip, support, pay, deploy an unarmed civilian protector for about $35,000 a year. Where you and I, if we pay our taxes in, in the United States, are paying a million dollars a year to deploy one soldier to Afghanistan. Wow. So Bill, we're the fiscal conservatives. Oh, indeed. And this what is a bargain, effective. 35,000 compared to a million. Yes. And we can grow this and continue to do so. And we're finding that there's increased recognition, not only at the Vatican, as you mentioned, that happened in the middle of April, but the UN is increasingly starting to recognize that unarmed civilian protection is an essential part of the approach to protection and protecting civilians. One of their educational uh, programs now is unarmed civilian protection, isn't it? Well, they had two major reviews last year, global reviews, that don't happen that often, about once every 15 years. One on UN peace operations and the other on women, peace, and security. Both of these reviews not only cited unarmed civilian protection, but also recommended that the UN cooperate, work more closely, fund, and scale up this approach. 
And so now we're finding that, of course, anytime there's change, you get pushback from the way things have been and yeah. always been. And you got to remember that the pushback's coming from a multi-billion dollar weapons industry. Uh, and so we're saying you don't need all those weapons. You don't need the drones. You don't need the bombers. And furthermore, when we're told, as so often, when we're presented with a conflict, we're told either we can stand back and do nothing and turn our backs on those poor people who are under threat, or we send in the bombers, we send in the military trainers, we send in the drones. This duality, it's either this or this, when in fact there is fertile, vast ground in between those two poles. And what we need to do... The various methods of having unarmed civilian protection. Yes. And so we will continue to present <coughs> this and to provide the examples by doing. Mm -hmm. We uh, always have our work externally evaluated. And uh, in a recent evaluation of our work in Mindanao, they found, they talked with the armed actors, and they found that indeed, the presence of unarmed civilian protectors did impact their behavior. It did change their behavior. Great. A scientific and, uh, proof. That yes. It works. And we'll continue to provide that proof. So how do you train your field staff then? It must be a, a very extensive training. To yes. They go through a, a rigorous training where, first of all, they focus on the three pillars of our work. The first is nonviolence. The second is nonpartisanship because we don't go to pick sides. We go to protect civilians. That's up to the local people to pick sides. And thirdly, the primacy of local actors. That it's, no one can make anyone else's peace for them. That's up to the local people to do. Mm -hmm. So they learn that, then they learn how to do, and those are the, they learn the various methods that are on the screen right now. There you see the 10 methods that come from protect proactive engagement, monitoring, capacity development, and relationship building. That is so important. Mm -hmm. And you can't build a very good relationship when you're holding a gun. No. Uh, and so then on the outer circle, you see the various methods that we employ in various combinations. So in training, they will learn about those methods. They will learn conflict analysis and how to apply the various methods to that particular conflict situation. And because conflicts are very dynamic, they're doing context analysis every day. And so the methods change depending on the context. Mm -hmm. Then also in training, they're learning that base within themselves that they go to for inner strength. We are totally non-denominational we have people who are in the field with us from all the major religions and those who profess no religion whatsoever. But everyone has within them a place they go for strength. So mm -hmm. to help people to identify that, to honor it, and to know how to access it. Uh, because that's important, because our people see some brutal, brutal things some things that I don't even care to talk about. And we have to get up the next morning. And so we have to have that fount. So you have to have a staff that's resilient and is able Resil to that's forgive. Right. That's right. Resiliency is so important. And sometimes that means that our people have to leave for trauma treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, because we yeah. deal with some very traumatic situations. Yeah. I can see some people would really be affected uh, having something similar to what the military uh, yes. calls PTSD. Yes, we have that in common. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, are there other facets of selecting your staff? That, uh, yeah, uh, you know, 
first of all, as I, I mean, mentioned, how, how many people in the world <laughs> can, can do that kind of thing? Thousands. Really? We never, ever lack for recruits. In fact, a recent class that we were recruiting, we could train 26 people. We cut off recruitment at 200. They came from 55 different countries. We did our first two levels of screening. We still had 90 people that cleared the first two levels of screening. We could only take 26. So by the time we get to that 26, we have some very skilled, very experienced people like the ones that you're seeing here who are going to uh, talk with the military. Uh, this was in the ceasefire period in Mindanao. And so we have people, and w one of the dynamics that's very important is almost half of our people in the field are women. Because women have unique perspectives and qualifications to peacemaking that so often are ignored. 4% of the UN armed peacekeepers are women. 4%. And so when you read about all the sexual abuse and exploitation that's taking part, place right now on the part of armed peacekeepers, those are primarily men. If you even up the odds and half the people in the field are women, those dynamics change, and they change dramatically. Hmm. And furthermore, what we're finding is that women who have been subjected to gender-based violence often relate much better to another woman than to an armed man. And yeah. so the fact that women are leading these projects in the field is extremely significant to our ability to protect. And so how many employees do you have? Uh, what percentage are women? 250 and half are women. Yeah. And our, yeah. our executive director is a woman. Yeah. Uh, the chair of our board until recently uh, was a woman. The um, head of our project in Syria is a woman. And so women are involved at, at every level of this work. And not because there's some politically correct quota, but because they are essential to peacemaking and to but, peacekeeping in the world today. But have any of your staff ever been hurt? Uh, women m more vulnerable to the strong man. Yes, we have had four conflict-related injuries in the 12 and a half years that we have been in the field. Uh, Uh, two of them were accidental. Uh, one w involved a kidnapping of a man of one of our uh, civilian protectors in the Philippines, and he was held for 111 days. This was six years ago, uh, and he was hurt during that time. And then... But, but he, he survived it. He survived, and you know, uh, at Christmas time, he texted me the photo of his baby boy. Oh, he got to be a father after all. Yes. And then there has been one woman who in December in Sri Lanka, uh, or not in Sri Lanka, in South Sudan, who was thrown to the ground by a South Sudanese uh, soldier and had a gun held on her, but several of our other team were there and they uh, intervened and interpositioned themselves and Finally, that soldier left. And so that's, we're, we're very fortunate uh, that we have not had more substantial injuries. But it's not only fortune. Our people are well trained on security. We have very strict security protocol because the strategy of a stop, stopping a bullet only works once. <laughs> and so our people understand our security. We have uh, the protocols that are in place. If people don't follow them, they go home. Because we aren't doing this to get ourselves killed. Right. We are doing this yeah. because this is an effective way to protect people in violent conflict. Sounds like you found the protocols that uh, enable the team to survive even, and so that you, you need to pull that person out if they are violating the protocols. Yes. 
And there have been times when we've had to pull the team from a particular locale. If we are unable to protect ourselves, then we're unable to protect others. So there's been a half dozen or so times in our history where we've had to withdraw the team from a particular locale. Yeah. In almost every one of those situations, we have been able to return after a period. But we're, we're not saying that this is perfect or that this works in every situation, mm -hmm. but it works in a lot of situations. So what are the next steps for the nonviolent Peace Force? We've just started a project in Syria where we are training uh, civilians who are active in Syria. Oh, is that a picture? Of no, this is actually a picture. We are uh, starting a project to provide protection for the refugees who are on, in route oh, going from, up from through Syria? Greece to Macedonia, not only from Syria, but from Iraq and Afghanistan, and then some uh, from Africa. But the lion's share come from Syria and then Iraq and Afghanistan. Hmm. And people are encountering increasing violence as there's bottlenecks, especially going up through Macedonia and Serbia, and they're getting blocked in Greece. And so we uh, just finished an assessment where our, uh, we will start to provide protective presence for refugees, primarily in Greece and along the Macedonian border. We are met sending a assessment team to Burundi in May to look at how civilians can help to prevent a massive violence, uh, outbreak of violence there and protect civilians who are increasingly under threat. We are working in Syria with uh, the Syrian Civil Coalition which is a coalition of 60 plus civil society groups, local groups in Syria who work on peace, on human rights, on reconciliation. I'm sure you've seen special reports on CNN. Yeah. No, you haven't. <laughs> because those guys never get in the news. <laughs> you oh, know, if someone has uh, a oh, suicide I... bomb, they lead. Yeah. But one but, of the but um, they don't report on uh, no on, on armed civilian protection or on those local peacemakers and we're working with a coalition of 60 over 60 groups who cross political religious and geographic boundaries some work in the government controlled areas some work in the opposition controlled areas some lean towards the government, some lean towards the opposition, some are neutral, but they have in common a commitment to a pluralistic future of Syria. And so we're working with them as they develop very localized civilian protection and violence deterrence projects in places throughout Syria. And then we will reconvene them periodically so they can reflect on their lessons learned. And more importantly, you'll, you'll recognize this, this is good organizing. Strengthen that base among each other and build, build trust through shared experience. Yes. And that provides a foundation for a future of Syria. That sure sounds like the right way to go. If uh, we invested 1% in that work that we're investing in the arms and the bombs in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria, if we took all that money up together and said, give that 1% to the peace builders, to the civilian protectors, to the people working on reconciliation, we would have a much different outcome. And think if we would have started doing that five years ago when mm -hmm the uh, outbreak in Syria began. Well, I want to sign the petition to <laughs> our government to see that that happens. Well, we can do that because, you know, there are uh, governments that are supporting us. Uh, we get funding, for example, from the European Union. We get funding from the Dutch, from the Norwegians, from the British, 
the Australians, and we're starting to get just a little bit of money from the United States. Uh, through and, what agency? Uh, through the USAID. Ah. And I believe that our country can invest much more without strings I, into peacemaking, peace building, civilian protection, and that we could invest as much as the European Union, for example. Yes, of course. And we would see very different outcomes, very different outcomes than a race to see how many more arms, how many more bombs, and now this pernicious approach of drones, yeah. where we can wage wars where we don't risk any U.S. lives. <laughs> but we terrorize civilians. Yes. We are not building friends in this world by doing that. We are not making our world safer. We are making our world more violent, more prone to look towards violent extremism when we take those kinds of paths. Instead, we can turn towards supporting those people on the ground who are working on peace, working on reconciliation, and they are there. I know them. I work with them. Take heart. They are there in the most violent places on the planet today. There are creative and courageous peacemakers and peace builders who are on the front lines. More often than not, cross-culturally, that work is being led by women. That's who deserves our support. Yes. It seems you found the key to uh, preventing some of the, so much of the violence. Yes. And uh, you've received a lot of recognition from the United Nations recently regarding unarmed civilian protection. Uh, would you tell us about that? Yes. There were the two global reviews that I mentioned, the uh, independent review of UN peace operations mm -hmm. and the review that was done by, uh, on women, peace, and security. Both of them recommended unarmed civilian protection and cited it, said it should be scaled up. And more recently, just in this past month, the committee of the troop supplying countries those countries that provide the troops to UN peacekeeping operations. They meet about a month a year in February. And their report, which they just issued, called for an increase of work and cooperation with unarmed civilian protectors. Wow, that's this is a big even step the forward. troop supplying countries. Yes. There is a recognition of anybody who's paying attention that the that's sum great. total of all armed approaches and unarmed approaches does not come close to meeting the need of people who are under threat. Uh -huh. We are at a precipice and we're starting to understand this as a species. We are at a precipice in terms of violence, in terms of environmental destruction, in terms of the divisions among people the divisions of wealth, and our better natures are coming forward. We need courageously at this moment to step forward and to reverse this. And we have it in us. We can do it, and it will take everything. Oh, I, I sure want to believe you. <laughs> How can I help? <laughs> there are. <laughs> You, you've received this recognition, so what are the next steps? There are a lot of things. One of the things that we're doing uh, as a next step is to gather up the best practices. Yeah. As I mentioned, there's a dozen organizations that are doing this work in various parts of the world, including dealing with violence in the United States, yeah. in, on the streets of our too. cities. Yeah. And so we ha have begun a process where we're looking at what are those methods that are working, which of those can better inform our practice in the field, what methods can be scaled up, can be replicated, so that more organizations can do this kind of work. Because 
unlike armed interventions that require a lot of money and a lot of weapons, this requires a lot of courage, a lot of strategy, and a lot of training. And so lots of groups can pick this up. What we're talking about is not the promotion of nonviolent peace force, as important as that is, but what we're talking about is a new approach to dealing with violent conflict that can be replicated and carried out by a lot of groups around the world so that it can take, take root and be done by a variety of groups, uh, many groups. So one thing that people can do now that we're in the election season in this country is to bring this up at candidates' forums. Uh, every what kind of question would you ask? What are the methods that our government could support to nonviolently protect civilians and deter violence? And see if any of the candidates can answer that question. Yes. But we have to plant that seed. We have to continue to spark the moral imaginations. No major candidate is talking about this. And that's uh, for good reason. Uh, that the, the myth of redemptive violence is so ingrained in our culture, from our cartoons to our political debates. And sometimes there's not a lot of difference. Uh, but that in the end, we have to turn to violence. We have to turn as a last resort to the violence. Myth, the myth. Yes. Uh, it tells us that. And but. yet there are other ways, and we are seeing those other ways. And as Gandhi said, those other ways are as old as the hills, mm -hmm. uh, yet they're new. And so people also uh, can volunteer with us. We have uh, an office right here in the Twin Cities in the Midway area of St. Paul. It's easy to get to. It's right on the, the light rail. Uh, we need volunteers. We need people who will host events in their homes, in their places of worship, where we can talk with people and engage about this approach. We need money. We need your money. Uh, people can donate tax-deductible contributions to nonviolentpeaceforce.org, and that will help us to continue to advocate, to educate, and to feel people uh, so that they can continue to show this new and effective way of protecting civilians. Also students, and this is something that's been very exciting to me, we're finding that students are studying this more and more. When I was at they're, they're doing what? Uh, they're studying unarmed civilian protection. Oh, more really? More. Tomorrow I'm speaking at St. Thomas. When I was in line uh, at the Vatican a couple of weeks ago, I was talking as we were waiting for our dinner, and uh, the fellow next to me had uh, started the Peace Studies program at Marquette University. And I said, well, my name is Mel Duncan. I'm from Nonviolent Peace Force. Have you ever heard about us? And he said, heard about you? I teach about you. <laughs> and so students, if their professors aren't bringing this up, they can bring it up and say, let's study this. They can go online and find all kinds of information. And we are in the process right now of completing a five-module e-learning course on oh, good. how to do this work. And UNITAR, the UN Training and research organization will host this e-learning course. Oh, good. And we're just, in fact, we have a conference call in the morning. We have the manual done. We have three of the five modules that are completed. So this will be available in the next couple of months. And Merrimack College in Massachusetts will offer credit. So students can offer, can take this course for college credit and really delve into how do you do this work? and get credit for it. So we're slowly institutionalizing how you do this work and the possibility. Great. <laughs> Are there, surely there's some other influential leaders that support this kind of work. Are, uh, who are they? We currently have 10 Nobel Peace Prize winners. 
uh, who support this work. Uh, those include Desmond Tutu, uh, Lech Valenza from Poland, Mairead McGuire from Northern Ireland, who was mm -hmm. with us in Rome a couple of weeks ago, Jose Ramos Horta, uh, who was the leader in East Timor that led to the independence yeah. of that country, and quite humbly, uh, Nonviolent Peace Force was nominated for this year's Nobel Peace Prize. Wow. And so we are one of, of uh, many worthy organizations uh, that have been nominated. But we are nominated by the American Friends Service Committee, who won the Nobel Prize in the late 1940s for their reconciliation and reconstruction work in Europe. And so yeah. even to be nominated by the American Friends Service Committee, by the what, Quakers, what an honor. is an honor in and of yeah. itself. A, a deserved honor by the sound of things. So what keeps you motivated, Mel? Oh, that's a good question, and it's not you, always easy. You, you, it seems like you, uh, you've been around forever, but you're still very <laughs> young. <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a compliment yeah. that I've been around. It seems like I've been around forever. Um, you know, there are the dark nights. There are the 2 a.m.s where I wake up fraught with anxiety, yeah. where there's nothing to do but weep. Yeah. And that's part of being in tune with the conditions of the world. There's times when I have bouts of depression. And that's real. And many of us suffer from that. Yeah. There's times when I've had to deal with trauma. So it's not easy. Yet. You're resilient. I hope so. Yeah. I, so far. <laughs> so far. Good for you. But, you know, you said what keeps you going. I spend about three quarters of my time in New York, and I spend a lot of that time working at the UN. In March, one of my colleagues, a young woman, 28 years old, spent a week with me, meeting with uh, countries on the Security Council, meeting with UN agencies. She walks through swamps up to her waist to get to the communities where she's serving. Mm. She works with some communities where 80% of the women have been raped. Oh. She and her colleagues right now are there doing this work. So when I wake up, I think about Shannon. Yeah. I think about Jane. I think about Derek. I think about Reddy. These are all people who are 30 and 40 years younger than you and me. Yeah. And they're there, and they're carrying it on. And that's what gives me hope. Beautiful. You know, um, so, can I give you one other yeah. example of hope? Uh, about two and a half years ago, I had heart surgery. Mm -hmm. I had uh, an aortic valve. I was born with a differently abled valve that wore out. So I got a cow valve. Oh. Uh, it put me out for a couple months. And when I recovered, I was back in Lebanon. And I, uh, two leaders of one of these groups that I was telling you about, one of these Syrian groups, two women looked at me and they came running over and they said, look at you, you're healthy, you're standing up. And then these two women who have been working in Syria said to me, we've been praying for you. They've been praying for me? Mm. You talk about resilience. <laughs> and we sat around that night talking. And we don't know where, where the, all this is going to go. We don't know what's going to happen. We do know who we can stand beside. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to stand beside those two women. Yes. 
as they pray for me. Mm -hmm. Isn't that humbling? It is. But that's what gives me hope. Mel, we've, we've only got four and a half minutes left, so. <clears throat> wow, I'm sure you could go on and on uh, in helping us uh, appreciate the, from these stories. Yeah. Do you uh, want some more stories? <laughs> well, let's cover a couple of other <laughs> questions first. Okay. Uh, who funds your work? Ah, good question. Follow the money. Yes. Um, our major funders include the European Union, the government of the ne Netherlands, Norway, the United Kingdom, Australia, the UN UNICEF program, UN Children's Fund, the UN High Commission on Refugees, a little bit coming now from the United States, and... Why only a little bit? Well, because we have to continue to work, don't we? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, from, from where? The from the USAID, the Aid for International Development. Oh, yes. And the, a significant portion of our money comes from individual donors. They're our rudder. They keep us true. And so we have uh, several thousand individual donors who give anywhere from a dollar to a hundred thousand dollars whatever they can give that is significant i uh, because we know we thrive on the hopes the dreams the aspirations the prayers and the dollars of yeah. individuals who truly want to bring change and so those donations are important <clears throat> places of worship yeah we tend to get support uh, from Quakers and Buddhists, but not exclusively. Uh, some Universalists, Unitarians support yeah, us. Uh, I, I worked on our social justice committee to make sure that we were supporting uh, nonviolent peacemakers. That's right. Peace force. That's right. And so, and some foundations and trusts in the United States. So there's a variety of ways that people in this country give, and, and we rely on that. That's essential. So, what are the upcoming U.S. elections going to mean? What, what could they mean for your work? Well, it means really whether we go ahead uh, based upon fear and anxiety and increasing violence, or whether we can turn towards building trust. And I'm not saying that we do that with any kind of false premise, but that we build confidence and trust step by step. It's a matter of what direction we're going to go. And I think that those directions are ch clearly being charted and delineated in this election. Whether we want to continue to cordon off people as the other, because remember how I got started in this. It was understanding our unity. The more we divide and say, you're this and we're that, then that begins to provide a foundation for violence. The more we start to understand we're us mm -hmm. and we're in this together. We are. And we can pull out of this together. And so those are the themes that need to be put forth well, in this election. Yes. and. People, individuals coming forward to help. And, and oh, we've only got 30 seconds left, <laughs> Mel, and I just want to thank you so much for teaching us uh, about nonviolent peace force and about all the things you've contributed to uh, help the UN with their unarmed civilian protection and uh, Help, help the Pope with his uh, <laughs> revisioning of just war into just peace. That's right. Well, Congratulations. Thank you. thank you, Bill. This has been fun.